I look back on the 25 years of work that we've done, there's been enormous success there, but it means almost nothing. We've moved, the MTA case alone is up to three billion now. It's a 10 year old decree. We have transferred three billion into the system that 500,000 poor bus riders needed. The reason we went to court and I told the bus riders union we would never win in federal court was that because they were, the, 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 the 15 politicians that make it the Metropolitan Transit Authority were taking the last 60 millions of bus capital to do a rail feasibility study. And you have to understand that 95% of the passengers in, in Los Angeles are poor bus riders. 95% of the mass transit riders are, 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 and it's a 500 square mile city. You gotta understand how big LA is. You cannot live without a car. So if you are too poor to own a car in LA, your life can hang by a thread. You can't get to a hospital. You can't, do, when my clients get up at four o'clock in the morning and they have, and, and on average they have two children, uh, they, they can't afford daycare because they're making below the minimum wage. Many of them are immigrants and can't claim the minimum wage and can't protest. So they get on one bus and drop one child off at a mother's and another child off at a sister's. By that time, it's 5.15. They have to have another transfer to get on another bus and drive another 20 miles on a bus ride that stops because they don't have any express buses and they didn't have any compu commuter buses to, to then get dropped off at work. On the way home, she's got to take the bus to the shopping mall, shopping supermarket, the one supermarket in 16 square miles because we don't have supermarkets still in, in the ghettos and barrios. Then she's got to go pick up the kids. It's another thing. So she's taken eight bus rides by the end of the day. And what the MTA was going to do was going to drive the bus system into a ditch. We had to save it. All we, the really only thing we did was stabilize that system. And we kept the fare steady for nine years. That system, that case, which we shouldn't have won, but we did because we created a collaboration amongst bus riders, the Reason Foundation, which is a, a libertarian Republican uh, think tank, that is not an oxymoron. Some of them actually do produce good, good, good analysis. You just have to know which ones. And, and I, I don't do drive-by labeling. Just because you're Republican doesn't mean I'm not going to work with you. If you're smart and you have a solution and I need you politically, I'll have you on my team. I learned that with, to get, keep the Ninth Circuit from touching your cases, if you have libertarian think tanks as part of your team, they don't touch the injunctions. Clue one, get rid of the ideolog ideological bent and look for smart solutions and get the partners that you need to get the results that you need for this population. Um, we had uh, the Cato Institute, if you can believe it. Uh, we had RAND. So I had every single transit expert in the country locked up on my case. I'm a ruthless litigator. I don't lose. I've lost one case in 15 years. We do not lose. We are damn good lawyers. And for you youngsters out there, get a law degree. It's a good weapon. It's a very good weapon. It's not the only weapon, but it's a very good weapon. And it's very rigorous thinking. Um, so in that case, we had to have, uh, we, had, we had 27 lawyers by the time I got done. It was a team of 27 lawyers. We had my bus rider clients, who are probably the last Maoists in Los Angeles. <laughs> the Maoists with the Republican Libertarians, with the elite, Blue Ribbon elite, Ivy League educated lawyers from NRDC, MALDEF, ACLU, my organization. It was a circus. It was a three-ring circus, and I was the ringmaster. The, the conflicts weren't racial. We had every racial group that you can think of. I purposely put in white bus riders as claimants because I, I refuse to have simply racial claims. I do it multiracially. It's about poverty. But unfortunately in this country, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against the poor. You can't do it on the basis of race and you can't be, do it on the basis of gender anymore. It is still legal to uh, 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 discriminate against gays, lesbians, and transgendered folks. It is definitely uh, kosher to uh, abuse and exploit immigrants. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, discrimination that are nominally illegal, but, but are still on, 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 uh, in practice, uh, uh, still barriers we have to overcome. Um, but the fault line in that case, you, you talk about an action team that is after three to five billion dollars for poor people, using a case as a vehicle to save a system that the poor desperately need. That's what that case was. It was an alternative vehicle for public policy because the politicians were too stuck on stupid to understand that 96% of their mass transit users were bus riders. You would go to these politicians. These are politicians that have been elected because of the Voting Rights Act. You know there's the end of an era. When that, in that lawsuit, and I had to explain to my clients that they had to sign waivers 
because I was suing a former NAACP Legal Defense Fund lawyer who was the executive director of the MTA. Two of the board members on the Metropolitan Transit Authority were NAACP Legal Defense Fund board members. And when, I, when we filed the case, Bill Lee and I flipped a coin because one of us was going to have to resign. We just knew we were going to get fired. But we were not going to let the bus riders down. We didn't care if LDF fired us. We would just hang a shingle and we'd proceed with the case. So when, when we flipped the coin, it was 4 o'clock in the morning, and the morning we had to file the case, and, 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 and I said, okay, I'll put my, I'm putting my name on it, Bill. You need to stick with LDF. Elaine Jones found out that we had filed the case, and she called me that night, and she said, Connie, 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 I got a Jack Daniels and two aspirin. Please, please tell me you did not sue two of my bosses. Couldn't you have just sued one? Why two? <laughs> Elaine was the first woman uh, council director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the first woman to succeed Thurgood Marshall. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund is Thurgood Marshall's law firm. It is the best law firm in the world to work for. It was a privilege. But after 60 years, the civil rights rubric, the civil rights tools had become exhausted. They were afraid. My colleagues were now on the boards I was suing. They were now the obstacles to justice, to fairness to good allocation of public resources, to logical transportation planning, whatever hook you want to hang it on. Um, we didn't go in talking about race. We went in there. Unfortunately, stupidity is not unconstitutional either. <laughs> so you frame your cases around race, but you can also put poor whites in as a class. And if you get the right judge, you keep it in there as a principle, even though the Constitution does not protect poor white people. Uh, they will protect poor white people if there's a racial discrimination. We need to change our constitution to, to protect class because the poor folks can so easily get rototilled. We have liberal progressive politicians in Los Angeles. They are good people. I know. I've sued all of them. <laughs> I know them well. It's not Louisiana where you've got venality and corruption so bad that you can't work with folks. It's not New Jersey where the mob runs things. It's not New York where the power circles are so dense you can't penetrate them. And, and it's not Washington, D.C. where which, which Christmas party you got invited to in the White House determines your relevance. L.A. is wide open, and you've got good people running things. It's like Santa Cruz, only much smaller in terms of the quality and the, the civic-mindedness and the progressiveness and the problem-oriented mindset of the politicians. We're actually very lucky. But money corrupts. We had $60 billion in subway. Who's going to ride a subway in an earthquake zone in a city that's 500 square miles? And the only way that they could build the subway was to bankrupt the bus system which served 95% of their passengers. It was idiotic, but I was the one who was stupid. I actually thought mass transit authority meant that you planned transportation for the masses. Now how stupid could I get? It had nothing to do with bus riders. You would go into politicians who, who, who sit on homeless boards and, 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 and give wonderful speeches, and you would say, what about the bus riders? And they'd look startled. Oh, who? The bus riders, 95% of your passengers. And they, they, their eyes would glaze over. And I said, I don't get this. Finally, the, the light bulb went off. I can be a little slow. Light bulb went off. I sat straight up. I said, it's not about the buses. It's not about transportation. It's about power. Rail builds power. If you give a $5 billion contract a hundred million here, a hundred million there, to Tudor Saliba and Parsons Sprinkeroff, and these are all wonderful firms now building our schools. But if you give that money, and I'm a politician, you become a queen maker. They can't give money directly to you. That would be bribery. So you do indirect bribery. You hand out the contracts, and then you can call Tudor Saliba and say, I want you to fund that pack, and I want you to fund her race, but not his. You become a power broker. So they get addicted to rail. Who cares whether Maria Guajardo has a bus and a token? Who cares? Poor people don't bring you anything. When I came to realize that what we do is we try to affect the big institutions, because our theory of change is that while a thousand points of light are wonderful, and each of us is one of those points of light, a thousand points of light don't replace the sun. The sun being the real engines 
of wealth creation, the real engines of upward mobility are much, much bigger than anything charitable organizations or nonprofits can do. To pretend that the faith-based charitable sectors can replace the engines of government, the engines of capitalism, yes, capitalism, and the engines of the military is delusional. And that's being kind. Those engines, and when Martin Luther King wrote his last essay and best essay, it's never been, it, 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 it has nothing to do with dreaming. He'd be telling us, wake up and smell the crocodile. That essay has guided our work. He said, desegregating lunch counters is easy even though people died to end apartheid in this country. What the second phase of this revolution is going to require is the realization of equality. And that ain't gonna happen unless, and these are his words, unless there is a, quote, radical reconstruction of the United States economic and political systems. Radical reconstruction. His words. He didn't mean communism. What he meant was harnessing the powers of capitalism to create wealth from the bottom up. Harnessing the power of the military instead of making it kill, use it to build. He was talking about radically reconstructing the distribution of political power in this country. And he was talking about the politics of the Grand Alliance when he said the poor white man and the poor black man, and in those days that was the paradigm. Today he would say poor Latinos and, 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 and poor Filipinos and poor Hmong and poor Southeast Asians. He would include them all. The poor of all races must band together because they are going to be made obsolescent. That's his phrase. Made obsolescent by automation. That was in his Playboy interview. He called it 45 years ago. He said automation is going to put poor people, make them irrelevant. What he didn't know is that it was going to make the middle class irrelevant as well. <laughs> but he called it for the bottom 10%. And he said if the poor white man and the poor black man don't stop hating one another in the old American covenant, which is to promise poor whites that you will always have social superiority over niggers, if you just accept your position. That's the, that's the American deal between poor whites and poor blacks. Get rid of that old deal and come up with a new deal, the Grand Alliance. Because if poor whites and poor blacks didn't demand job creation for them together, they would both become obsolete. Completely written out of the American script. The other engine making poor people completely irrelevant. And I have to say, when I look out as proud as I am of the progress that's been made in this country, I think we have been the witnesses and the abettors of annihilation of an entire class of people in our country. You cannot look at a 75% incarceration rate and call it anything else. You either believe in the crime gene or our policies have actually <coughs> effectuated the annihilation of an entire male population. It is astounding. The first time that I went down to Jordan Downs housing project was in the riots. I said I've only been in the LDF job for three months. The riots came. I said, oh good, I'm just in time. I hadn't been down to the black housing projects. Our housing projects in LA are more segregated than the Sale of Texas's housing projects, but that's another story. Jordan Downs, Imperial Courts, and Nickerson Gardens are uh, gang-dominated housing projects. City-owned properties run by criminal gangs. It's astounding. City-owned properties. You do not ask LAPD for permission to go into the Jordan Downs gym. You ask the Grape Street Crips. You talk about civic dysfunction. I didn't know any better. I drove down in my little Honda hatchback Civic, Civic Honda hatchback. It looked like a tin can. I had the Colombo theory on cars. The worse it looks, the more money I make when it's stolen. 
I drive down there, park on, park on Grape Street, and I'm in my, I had been in court that day, so I, I'm looking like a black Republican. I've got the pearls and Barbara Bush pearls and the John, the St. John suit. You know, you gotta look the part when you go in there. I really can look the part, believe it or not. I have my hair on the top of my head, not a nose. I, can, I really can look the part. And um, I, waltz, I, 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 I waltz into the gym, and, and there are these grandmothers and aunts, and they're women, women. I said, oh good, I'm good with women. I'm not very good with the men, but I'm, I'm very good with the women. So I waltz in there and I, I, I said, hello, my name is Connie Rice. And Mrs. Tolliver stood up and she said, you light, bright, damn near white bitch. Where were you when we were putting our children to bed in a bathtub in these crack wars? Where were you when they rounded our sons up and stripped them and took pictures of their tattoos and then round them up with no probable cause, no warrants, no nothing. Where were you? She went down a list and because she was a prospective client, I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I said, you're absolutely right, Mrs. Tolliver. The black middle class has completely left you behind. The white middle class was never here. We've abandoned you and you have a right to be angry. Now I can leave or you can tell me how to help you. She cussed me out some more. She's been a client for 15 years. We're actually quite close now, but <laughs> she was right. I'm Sally Hemmings. I escaped. I've never, never had to face what she's doing. She's angry. She's angry about being abandoned. She should be. So I asked the women, what should I do to help? And they said, save our men. Save our men. Help our men. So here's this feminist, Murphy Brown. My white feminist friends didn't know what in the hell had taken a, a, a hold of me. I said, how do I help them? She said, get that truce. Make that truce happen. Because they were in the biz, they were right there negotiating a ceasefire. They were trying, actually the violence had gotten so bad that the older gangsters were actually afraid because there was no Sicilian code anymore of when to kill and whom to kill. I said, where are they? She said, they're in the bunker. So I went behind Markham Middle School at 105th and Century and I knocked on this bunker door in my pearls and pumps and my St. John suit. And the door opened up and there's this guy with this red bandana on his head and I'm looking in there and there's these, 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 these rusty looking men, I'm telling you, they were some tough looking characters in bandanas, blue and, blue and red. And I said, my name's Connie Rice, I'm a civil rights lawyer, I'm here to help you. Well, he looked at me like I, I had lost my medical prescription. <laughs> and promptly closed the door. <laughs> so I, I, I waited. I figured they were trying to figure out whether they're gonna, what they're gonna do with me. And uh, one of them opened the door and said, uh, who are you again? I said it again, he closed the door again. And two more door closings and he came back and, 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 and they, they brought me in. And uh, what was fascinating about it was I said, I said, I'm from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And it's not the NAACP because you, you have to distinguish yourself when you're, when you're under clay. You have to say you're not the NAACP because you, you might get lynched if you don't. And what was fascinating is that while middle class African Americans probably couldn't even tell the difference between these two organizations, one of them said, we know who you are. You, you, you ain't, you ain't the, the, those, those trifling niggers. You're with Thurgood Marshall. They knew. They knew. That was an eye opener. And then the second thing was, you want to help? They had a list of things they needed me to do. They said, we need midnight basketball because the guys who have hits on one another, who are slated to kill one another, if we can make them play on a team together, they won't kill one another. So we need the midnight basketball, but LAPD won't let our permits go through. We need you to get the permits so we can use the gym at four o'clock in the morning. From 11 o'clock at night until six o'clock in the morning, you've got to keep them playing basketball or, they, or, or the murders continue. What did I know? They're my clients, I'm gonna get them what they need. And they said, you're gonna have to bring some lawyers down here and stand up and you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to stand in the gym. I said, at two o'clock in the morning? They said, yeah, that's what we need. Then they said, and get, get, get us a copy of that agreement that those Jews and Arabs did in Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you referring to the Egyptian Sinai Accords? Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, if the Jews and the Arabs can get, a, can get, can get an agreement, we can get an agreement. <laughs> So I, I got the accords and came back down and, and showed them and, and then they wanted to know how that had been and they wanted to know how, it, so, so they wanted that process documented. After I came through on a couple of things, 
and understood that they had been pimped and used and put in movies and they had a lot of middle class people come down there to use them, but nobody had ever stuck with them, I decided that I was going to do a bargain. And the bargain was these men were facing annihilation. This was even before three strikes. Started out with seven, working with 17 of them. The truce actually held. The reason I know is not because of them or because of the cops, because both sets of folk will lie to you. Cops will lie to you and the gangsters will lie to you. You go to the hospitals, the emergency rooms, because they keep the shootings and stabbings, they keep a tally of the causes. So there's a column for cross-color shootings, meaning inter-gang in between gang. There's intra-gang, there's domestic violence, there are like seven categories of violence. So I get those sheets and you could see the cross colors plummet. Zero, one, two, no escalation. Six months, zero, 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 zero. That truce stopped the Crips bloods violence. It did not stop the intra-Crip and intra blood violence. And it certainly did not stop the domestic violence. But it did stop the war. When I understood, I started trying to understand the mentality. Because it wasn't about helping them get back up to a Sicilian code of killing so that they could be more like the mafia. It was to get them out of that hyper-masculine insanity. And I began to understand, if I was going to help these men, I had to understand them enough. And as a feminist, it's very hard. But even a feminist understands that if you take the men out of a community, that community dies. We're killing that community because we've taken all of the men out of it. And if you take the women out of a community, an entire civilization dies. They were facing annihilation. If anybody's stupid enough to mess with me, I might face some discrimination. Very few people survive an attack on me. I don't face anything compared to what they face. My bargain was that if I helped them fight the juggernaut against them, that was plowing them into a criminal justice system that is third world plus, if I helped them fight, they would eventually get to a point where they would come to the issues that my feminist friends and I were concerned about. If I stuck with them in their battle, they would come around. So I never, although they treated me like a queen, an honorary man really, <laughs> talked to me, trusted me, I came to understand that when you emasculate men to survive, they become hyper-masculine. That's the human response. These men are emasculated in every way from the time they're four. And as I understood that hyper-masculinity, the hyper-violence, the hyper-machismo, the, the, the very thin honor, if you step on my tennis shoes, I have to kill you because that's all I have, is my notion of my status. And it is attached to a cult. We have left the children to the psychopaths to cope with this emasculation. And it is a very deeply uh, pathological dynamic I don't make any excuses for it. I don't romanticize them. I don't, I don't defend gangs. My mission is to get these kids out. I want exit ramps. And I don't want these cults to exist. But I had to stick with them long enough to learn who could change and who couldn't change. And 10 years of this work, constantly going down there, constantly getting them out of jail, constantly interceding in LAPD, bringing lawyers down there. If they were working on a truce, I did that. If they wanted to get turkeys for Thanksgiving, we'd get Safeway to bring a truck in. Staying by them, not taking any credit, not getting on television and saying, I work with gang members, all of that stuff that middle class people love to do, to make themselves feel relevant. Just working with them every day. Three strikes came, and out of the 17, nine are dead and or doing life in prison. Of the, remaining, of the remainder, three are really functional and made it. I found other sets, Bo Taylor and the American groups. Barrios Unidos had a, had a set 
in Los Angeles at the time. There were other organizations like Homeboy Industries. And as I bonded with more and more of these men, an extraordinary thing happened in, after 10 years of working with them. I called up and they said, lady lawyer, lady lawyer, you're gonna, be, you're, gonna, you're gonna be at the meeting on Saturday. I was furious. I hate having to drive on Saturdays. I hate driving in LA. Saturday, I just stay at home and I'm thankful I don't have to get in my car. They were making me not only get in my car, but drive all the way out to the airport 40 miles away. And they kept saying, lady lawyer, you got to meet the meeting. Jim Brown needs you at the meeting. Jim Brown, need I, so they, I know when they're invoking Jim, they really mean for me to be there. And I was if you call me one more time, I'm not coming. Okay, okay, later, but you gotta be there. You gotta be. I couldn't figure out what was going on. What was this meeting? I said, what's about, well, we can't tell you. I should have known something was up then. I drive to the airport, the Futurama Hotel, this ticky-tacky hotel on the edge of the airport. Get out of my car, I'm cussing a blue streak underneath my breath because I'm furious I had to be there. And I'm marching up the stairs, just angry as I can be. And what the, it ain't one. Yeah. <clears throat> and I open the doors into a room that I think is a meeting room, and it's a ballroom. Full of tables with pink, tablecloths and white roses on them. <laughs> Not a birthday, something much more important. The banner read, forgive us. These men, these macho men who had served 15 years for armed robbery, had done murders, just, just, just some of the toughest characters you can think of. I had never talked about gender equity. I had never, they always treated me very well. They never mistreated women in my presence because they knew I'd kill them. <laughs> but we never talked about feminism or women's rights because we were focused on saving their lives. There was something more important and fundamental here. 10 years later, they had recovered to a point. They had reclaimed and redeemed a sense of masculinity that was based in enough security and enough self-esteem that they wanted to ask our forgiveness. They had their mothers there, their sisters, their babies, mamas, many of them. They had lawyers like me, po women politicians who would help them. And they had us all in this ballroom. Each gave us a white rose and they got up on stage and in tears, with the big gold chains and the bowler hats, got on their knees and said, we beat you. We were afraid of you. You made us feel even less like men because we couldn't provide for you. We don't know how to talk to you. And the middle class men in, in the audience were saying, amen, man, well, I need to be up there too because I'm just as confused about these women as they are. But they begged for forgiveness. And they pledged to take care of their children. And they said, we will never lay another hand on you. We need to respect you and honor you as the mothers of our children, as the women we love and thank you for loving us when we shouldn't have been loved. That was the most amazing dinner. It went on for five hours, the testimonials. And then James Ingram broke out in find 100 ways and all of us were in puddles. I mean the women, the women, the mothers and the daughters and the sisters and the aunts and the grandmothers. It was the most amazing transformation. And the other transformation was with rock. Some of these guys can't talk to me, I'm strange. They can't figure out whether I'm white, I talk funny, I talk fast, I look strange, they don't know what I am. I look like E.T. to these guys. <laughs> and they don't know how to talk to me. And some of them just know that I'm there to help and they kind of nod, but there's always with respect and I just nod back. For nine, nine years we nodded at each other. Never said a word. We were up at Jim Brown's house and Rock said, lady lawyer. And I had to hold on to my chair because it was Rock. I said, Rock? He said, I ain't the predator you met 10 years ago. I've evolved and I'm now fit to talk to you. Now, you can't let tears come to your eyes in front of these guys because you gotta be tough, you know. And I let him know he had always been fit to talk to me, but I'm glad that he felt comfortable at this point. His transformation over that 10 years by sticking with him, he had completely transformed. And the segue to education is the kid who came into my office in the mid early, early 90s, right after the riots, and he came in and, yo, 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 Ms. Rice, Ms. Rice, I found out I'm dyslexic. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I got, I got what they call dyslexic. 
He said, I always thought I was stupid. I couldn't read. By a year, he was reading at a fifth grade level because um, he had been diagnosed. And I thought, we've killed these children because they have no ability to read. I had to read those Egyptian Sinai chords because most of the guys in that room couldn't read them. They wanted them, but they couldn't read them. And that's how he started to get into education. And my boss wanted me to bring a desegregation suit. I said, what are we desegregating? There are no white kids. It's mostly a Latino system with 20% blacks. We've got Hmong, we've got <coughs> Japanese, Filipino. We, we, ha we have Filipino kids who need special language instruction because they learned how to speak Ebonics from their black friends and they with a Tagalog accent. <laughs> what are we going to be desegregating? This is not Alabama. I refused to bring a desegregation case because we would have won it and we wouldn't have helped a single kid. Not a single kid would be reading better because of a desegregation case. Not a single kid would be in AP courses because of a desegregation case. So I refused to bring one. This system, this education system, which has a 75% dropout rate in Jordan Downs High School, the high school next to the housing project where I got cussed out trying to help the gang bangers negotiate their truce, 75% dropout rate. I don't know what you have the school open for. Now it's true, the district-wide dropout rate is only 30%, but I'm focusing on the schools that are underwater. I began a journey, an exploration, because I need to know the depths of the dysfunction before I sue you or before I take you on or take somebody out of office, whatever it is we have to do, because we're an action tank, we're not just a law firm. We figure out, we're very good at, 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 at wicked diagnosis. Wicked diagnosis. We can get to the core of a problem. It's not the RAND level of analysis. That's usually structure, organization, power, governance. It's very important analysis, but it does not get to the core of the kind of dysfunction we're talking about. We've had every single kind of school reform you can think of. School-based management, learn. We've had, we've had uh, school-based budgeting. You name it. We've had multicultural education. We, we've had every experiment in the world in education, in, and it hasn't made a difference. Not in the schools with poor children. Because the truth about the education conundrum in this country is that we have a very good education system for our kids. The public education system simply doesn't work for poor children of any race. You can go to Appalachia, you can go to a Native American reservation, the poorest children in the country in, in just raw numbers are Native Alaskan, but the children with the highest, with the fastest rate of increase of poverty are poor rural white children in the South. Marion Wright Edelman was right. We completely wrote Otell our poorest children, our most defenseless citizens. So the public school system works fine. We send kids to Berkeley and, and Santa Cruz and Stanford and Harvard from our public schools every year but not for poor children. So let's get that diagnostic point right. Then when you take on a bureaucracy like LA Unified, and I call the LA City Council the Kremlin. It's like dealing with the KGB and the Kremlin. LA Unified is so much worse, you can't even call it the Kremlin. You have to have another framework of analysis, and I, I, I quickly dubbed it the Forbidden City. Mao Zedong has been ruling the country for 20 years, and they're still doing imperial exercises in the Forbidden City. It is the most politically isolated entity. It, is, it has a capitalized budget of over $10 billion. That school district has 800,000 children. It has more children than San Francisco has residents. And you can walk around San Francisco, in, it's six miles around. LA Unified has, a bit, has twice the budget of the city of Los Angeles. It is gigantic and it has dysfunction to match. All you need to know about this district, and this was part of our analysis, this is the kind of thing that I anthropologically dig for. I want the top 10 stupidest things they've done in the last 10 years so that I can understand the depth of that bureaucratic culture. What is this bureaucracy? LAPD is a Praetorian Centurion Guard culture. They're actually pretty easy to deal with. They're ruthless, but they're smart. They're brutal, but they're very smart. With LAPD, it is a question of will. With LA Unified, it is a question of ability. 
You get in there and you realize, and you get in the elevator. I thought the teachers were children. I went into one school with Phyllis Hart of the Achievement Council. I learned what I know from think tanks that specialize in the Achievement Council, education, uh, uh, the Education Trust West, uh, Russell and uh, Ollie O'Connor is, is a mentee of mine. Um, so I glom on, I say, teach me this stuff, pour it into my head so I can really get down to the bottom of this. Because we've had 50 years of reforms and none of them have worked. I don't need to repeat that. I need to know why they haven't worked. It's not that they haven't tried. We just haven't diagnosed it right. I went into a couple of classrooms in East LA. This teacher looked young enough to be my daughter. That wasn't the problem. She had no classroom management training. She had 36 seven-year-olds. 36 seven-year-olds. A master teacher can barely handle that. But she had no classroom training at all. She had Cal State's teacher certification. If you look at that curriculum, that is part of the problem. I wasn't taught by teachers who could barely pass the CBIST and the Cal State exams. Those are not rigorous enough. I was taught by women like my mother. We benefited from sex discrimination because women like my mother couldn't be president or secretary of state or the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. They were in schools. And we directly, directly benefited from sexism. The limits on women's opportunities meant that the most brilliant people in this country were teaching us. That is no longer the case. It's no longer the case. You go to that Cal State curriculum, I looked at Janethia Hayes, who's my best, one of my best buddies next to Molly Munger, and I said, we, 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 get me, get me, get me, get me the C4. We're blowing it up. It's got to go. This entire curriculum is so dumbed down. I don't know how you teach anything. This child had gone through that. She had the equivalent, in my judgment, of a, of a mediocre community college education. And she was teaching poor four-year, seven-year-olds who did not get the stimulation that kids like my family get. My mother reads the New York Times to, to, to infants. <laughs> We're reading by three and a half. And it is not an option to fail. Academic achievement, I think my third word was college. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I was going. <laughs> that is the Barnes-Rice way. These children didn't have any of that. One little kid I ran into in, in one of the, uh, uh, after the welfare to work, uh, you had to get daycare for the women if, if they were ever going to get their resumes together and actually get jobs. So you had to take care of the kids at night. And Karen Bass at the community coalition, I would go over there and help the women fill things out and, and uh, uh, make sure they were. But, but I would wander into the, the daycare center, uh, the night care center, and then look at the kids. And these were children who didn't know what the sun was called in any language. Not soul, not sun. They didn't know what that thing in the sky was called. You're talking about a level of understimulation and underdevelopment that was startling. So you wonder why we need pre-K. But the diagnosis went to things like, not only could she not manage the class, but she had never heard of the diagnostic tools that you have to use before you figure out how to teach a child to read, so that you pick up on the different kinds of dyslexia and learning disabilities. She had never been taught the pedagogy of reading. Reading is the hardest thing that you can teach a human being. And you have to be a specialist. It is an art. She had never even had a basic course. I knew more about those tests. She didn't know what I was talking about. So there was an, there was an, an IQ deficit here that was devastating. Even if the children had been ready to learn, this was not the teacher who was going to bridge those gaps. The teachers who could bridge those gaps were in the schools teaching my friend's kids. They were in the good schools, in the good neighborhoods. We had the weakest, most underprepared, some totally unprepared. Some of them were simply substitutes for the children who knew the least and had the least. And nobody was talking about that, because it would have meant the democratic politicians would have had to take on the teachers' union. Okay? Understanding, get out of this party analysis, get out of these ideological boxes. You have got to stay focused like a laser on what it takes to solve the problem. And you cannot be afraid to sue your friends, your bosses' bosses, or anything else. You have to be able to take on the obstacles. Now, I will talk to you for about a day. And then if you don't get it, we're going to have to come at you, either with a lawsuit, an election that takes you out of office. We are going to 
get the strategic action plan that is going to get what's needed. Well, in our diagnosis, Sid Thompson was the superintendent at the time we started this exploration of, of LA Unified. The first SAT-9 scores came out. The first time the SAT-9 standardized test came out. Negative territory. I mean, you get nine points for signing your name. They had negative scores for the averages for these schools. It was astoundingly bad. I hadn't woken up yet, but Janethia was on my phone. It was 6.30. Get up. Get outside and get that paper. Get, get just, I, well, Janethia, what are you talking about? Get outside and get your damn paper. She was furious. She had read the scores. So I'm sitting there reading the paper with her, you know, with the phone like this and try, trying to get to the page where the scores are. Do you see these scores? I mean, she's furious. She's just furious. She makes me look calm. <laughs> get up. We're, we're going down there now. I'm, I'm meeting you. So she has me go meet her. 45 minutes later, I'm at the school headquarters in the superintendent's office, and she's telling him, get that colored man you work for and get him out here now. <laughs> she also, when she called Mayor Reardon out of, out of, out of his office, she told Kelly Martin, you get that white man you work for and get him. So this is just her way of, <laughs> this is just her way of, uh, of when she's angry, of summoning public officials. <laughs> I'm her attorney, of course, and, and we're standing there with our briefcases, and, and, and Janethia has her hands on her hips. That's not a good sign. You do not want Janethia with her hands on her hips. <laughs> Sid comes out, and, and, and Janethia just takes him like, like he's in her parlor or her living room, like, like it's her place. It's his office, right? Sid, darling, sit down. <laughs> what is this? And she slams the paper down and points at the scores. And Sid Thompson, he's a very nice man, been superintendent for about five years. He looked at Janethia, and he said... Tanithia, I don't know how these scores happen. I don't understand these children. I don't know where they came from. And I don't have a solution. Tanithia patted him on the hand and said, baby, we love you. We love you very much. We're very proud of you. You started out as a chauffeur and you rose all the way up to superintendent. Now what kind of cake do you want at your retirement party? <laughs> and where do you want to go? He said, I want to go to UCLA. She said, get, get, get Chuck Young on the, on the phone and get him on the phone and get him in office with a window. I was on the phone with Chuck Young. We got him in office with a window. He was out of there. Unfortunately, the racial politics, the stupidity of the racial politics, they, they decided they wanted a Latino superintendent, but they didn't, they, they didn't decide they wanted a smart Latino superintendent. <laughs> so they put in Ruben Zacarias, who is another darling man, just sweet as he can be, Sid had three synapses firing in his brain. Reuben had two. Couldn't organize a two-car funeral. Had even less of a clue. Janethe and I were furious. Long story short, we dealt with a black board member thinking that maybe we could deal with her. I don't think she could read. We tried for six years. Way too long. Don't, 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 don't toy that long. You gotta act before that. <laughs> Finally, after five years of trying to help this woman get an agenda together, she decides that her main contribution to the educational advancement of LA's poorest children is going to, she's going to stop tracking the few kids who get into the A through G sequence to get be eligible for UC because there were so few kids completing that it made the school district look bad. Now that was her idea of a policy change. Janethia came to her and said, if you do this, and, and Barbara Boudreau looked at her and said, you think you belong on this board? Well then take my seat. Janethia walked out to her, she was furious, she called me, she said, get your high yellow ass down here now. <laughs> You notice there's a theme here about uh, color cast, and it's, it's a black thing, you have to understand. <laughs> and bring that wonderful white woman you run around with who's my law partner, Molly Munger. She was angry enough to eat glass. You don't tell women like us, take my seat, because we will do it. Denethia had us down there. I drove her back to SCLC. I went to Darius Schrago, who raises all the money for the California Assembly. Went up to his office with my little yellow pad. I said, how do you take an elected official out of office? Just tell me the list. I said, it can't be that hard. You do it. <laughs> Just tell me the things you have to do. Connie, can I ask you whom you're taking out of office? <laughs> I said, it's Barbara Boudreau. She says, he said, uh, do you have the unions with you? I said, of course not. Do you have a single black elected official? I said, who needs them? <laughs> no, of course not. They're going to back whatever black incumbent is there. You don't take a black elected out of office. They're dead. They stay there. You just fill them with formaldehyde. Still vote for them. <laughs> we mounted a campaign because here was our strategy. 
Our diagnosis was that you cannot do anything radical enough to a district that big until every kid had a seat. One of the things that we found out was that the dysfunction of this district was so massive that they had failed to build schools for 30 years. There were over 85,000 children with no seats. And in our research, you, can't, you cannot do anything to a district until there is a seat for every kid. And here was an NAACP Legal Defense Fund lawyer starting to mount a campaign to have kids in their neighborhood schools. We documented that five-year-olds wait in the dark to get on a diesel bus with a million miles on it. That's metal fatigue. The thing was about to fall apart. And they drive an hour and 15 minutes out to the valley because there are no local seats. You don't put five-year-olds on a bus. That's inhumane. And those diesel buses are deadly. This is what we've been doing to these children because they're poor and they're Latino. And we don't give a damn. We took, we, we, it wasn't enough to take Barbara Boudreau off that board, we had to take three others because we had to have Geneva as the president. Because the only, our diagnosis, the only decision that that board makes of any consequence is who's the superintendent. That was the only reason it was worth doing. It wasn't worth doing just to, just to get her out because we were mad at her. That's stupid. It wasn't about power. It was a strategy for getting the schools built because that is step one to any massive the only reason that the mayor can even propose his plan, or that Gloria Romero from the Senate could even propose her legislation to radically change that district is because we did seven years of work to get those schools built with a, with a competent construction authority. It took an incredible collaboration. We went to the Republican mayor and told him, we are taking Barbara Boudreau out. You are going to fund two more candidates we're going to pick. We need three of the seats. We actually need four, but we, we can find, it costs $1.4 million to take out an incumbent with an insurgent race. This is not, you don't need Stephen Hawking on this stuff, this is not rocket science. <laughs> After Derry gave me the list, I said, oh, this is easy, we can do this. This is much easier than filing a class action. Hell, I should have done this before, you all make money, I don't. <laughs> got the campaign together. Mayor Reardon got the other two candidates together. We told him we could raise half a million off of our Rolodexes but we could not raise 1.4 million. He would have to backfill. And if it meant a personal check from his Mattel fortune, then fine. But he had to back us. Because you do not go after an African-American incumbent unless you can really take him out. Um, when we got done, all three candidates won. It was a complete coup d'etat. Fired the superintendent, which caused all kinds of racial rifts because he was Latino. The racial politics, once again, rose. They're Latino leaders who still don't talk to me because we fired somebody they knew needed to be fired, but they didn't do it. I said, we got rid of ours. You, you, put, him, you put your moron in there, but didn't get rid of him. Now we're firing him. <laughs> we needed somebody who was a super politician who, couldn't, who, could, who could go up to Sacramento and turn the toxic reputation of the district around. But more than that, we needed a construction authority. This school district had 80,000 children with no seats. They hadn't built a high school. In 30 years, the one high school they decided to build, they gave it to a football coach to do. Why? Because it was his turn to do something important. He didn't realize that you had to have ecological and environmental tests done. So he put heavy concrete slab on an exploding methane and sulfur field. Sunk $150 million into a school that had to be raised. This is the level of thinking I'm talking about. When we took Sid Thompson out of his meeting, he was busy at 7 o'clock in the morning rewriting the school bulletins because the teachers couldn't understand 12th grade English. And, the, and he thought it was a victory because he had, they had wanted an 8th grade level, but he had gotten it up to 9 and a half, and he was really proud of that. When I say they were too stupid to sue, and when Elaine asked me why I didn't sue, I said because we'd win. I meant it. It wasn't enough to file a lawsuit. It wasn't enough to be part of a school-wide or city-wide movement of school reform. It wasn't enough. We had to get in there and take over the machinery of government. Six years later, we had to file a lawsuit. The children had to go to court to get the construction money because the district's lawyers didn't know how to do that kind of case. So we represented the children who went to court. We brought back the 750 million, but that was just the start. The diagnosis of LA's facilities problem was $25 billion. 
the district had been asking for three million a year they were never going to get the schools built and they couldn't master the politics in sacramento to get the money that was sitting there with their name on it long story short once we got the 750 million the district was so incompetent that no private construction firm would work for them so none of the construction companies would build these schools I turned to Roy Romer, who had, we'd installed as the superintendent, and said, we have to get the military. Mm -hmm. I remembered what Martin Luther King had said, get the military. We got, the, we got this Army Corps of Engineers to wire to schools electronically for the net, and we went to Fort Hainimi and got Captain McConnell. And we told Captain McConnell, you don't need an appointment in Annapolis, you need to come save 100,000 children. And he brought nine retired Navy captains, and we have the Navy Seabees building our schools. And <laughs> after we brought back the three, the three quarters of a billion for Captain McConnell, I said, don't worry, Captain, I promise you we'll get the rest of the money. The Democrats were too afraid to ask the public for $30 billion. They controlled, Gray Davis was in, they had the House. I mean, they had the Senate, they had the Assembly, and they had the governors, and we thought, oh good, we can now order the State Allocation Board to stop locking out urban districts from getting into the school construction money, because it was an allocation problem. It was a, a bond allocation formula that was rigged to make sure that no urban districts could get in line. They put all of the end criteria front, and we actually found a memo that said this will make sure the urban, the urban districts can't get in line. It was designed. And here was the trick. When I say, don't have any enemies, don't have any permanent friends, you some strategic allies. The Democrats were terrified of touching the third rail of school construction and would not order the state allocation board to allocate the existing bond money to school districts because they had taken too much money from the developers. And the developers need their developer fees capped. And the developers need empty schools sitting in the middle of new divisions. Because if you have an empty school, a new school, sitting in a new division, their profits go up 14 to 21%. The Democrats were in bed with the developers and sold these kids down the river. We had to go to court and get a ruling that it was a violation of Serrano, a violation of the bond enabling language. Just a it was totally illegal. But the Democrats couldn't act. They also wouldn't do any polling. I said, can't you find out what voters want? And here's another lesson. If you know you've got a $25 billion problem in LA alone, that means it's a $60 billion problem statewide for modernization and new school construction. It's not just LA, although LA is the 800-pound gorilla. Bottom line was, our schools were crumbling and we had kids with no seats statewide. The Democrats were too afraid. So we took $25,000 of our money, got Gray Davis's pollster so they couldn't ding our pollster, and went to conservative white Californians, Republicans mainly, and said, what would it take for you to vote for a $30 billion bond for children who are sitting on the floor? They told us, we don't want these incompetent school districts to be able to get their hands on a dime of the money. We want it completely segregated from their regular budgets and they can't use it for general uh, funds or anything else or teacher salaries or anything else. We want it dedicated and untouchable by the districts. We want a citizen's bond oversight committee that rides herd and gives thumbs up or thumbs down and, and, and rings the alarm when they start siphoning off money and failing to build the schools. And we want competent, independent construction authorities that the districts don't micromanage and put their friends in charge of. And we want a, and we want a contracting process that isn't corrupt, giving it to, to in, incompetent people who waste our money and we want to be able to look online they gave us a list that wouldn't end mm -hmm. we put all of that in the bonds you wonder why the 30 billion dollar statewide bond passed it was written on the computers in my law firm's office not any democratic office and we had to go up and become Jackie Goldberg's staff and Mike Marco Fireball staff and we went and got the Republicans to sign on and we did it with our map our mapping strategy. We have an integrated a, a, a data platform that is just amazing. We could show Republicans how many unseated kids they have and how little of the bond money they got. And we would go into these Republicans and we would say, Senator so and so, you know, it is just such a shame. You just didn't get what you deserved. And you know, we really need to be look at the children that didn't get the bond money and you really should have gotten it last time. Well, let me take a look at that. And they'd get their glasses on and, well, I'll be done. That's how we got the Republicans to sign on. And then we did a campaign based on the the focus groups. We've opened 66 schools. We now have 11 retired Navy captains running in. I'm a military kid. Military doesn't fail. The CB's motto is we do the difficult immediately. 
the impossible just takes a little longer. <laughs> they changed their motto when they came to LA. Because the other motto was, we build to fight. They had a banner outside their office, we fight to build because the bureaucracy. We still <laughs> couldn't get the Kremlin to let go of them. I am now president of the Bond Oversight Committee. I represent the controller. This is, so we moved from the lawsuit onto the board, took over the board of it. You see how the phases, and you had to change the vehicles, and the alliances changed for every phase of the battle plan. But as a result, the schools are going to get built, and Antonio Villaragosa is now in a position to actually seek statewide legislation that can finally, finally get a radical enough reconstitution and refurbishment. The diagnosis is that most of the schools in LA Unified do a mediocre job. A few do quite a good job. But in the schools, the children at the bottom of the well, the schools that Nane res the, the children Nane rescues and Bo Taylor rescues, the children we've left behind, that's where the emergency turnaround is. And you need to completely reconstitute them and take over in bankruptcy theory. And you have to get people, you have to completely redo their profession because you cannot attract the women like my mother and the men like my father and like the people in this room. The IQ is too low. We need Picassos and we have people who are trained to paint by numbers. That's the fundamental diagnosis and that's much bigger than any school district. That's a radical professionalization of the education realm. It means you have to pay principals $150,000 a year. It means you have to pay teachers, master teachers, starting at 60, the master teachers starting at 100,000. And they quickly get to 150,000. You cannot, you cannot get the quality of intellect. The teachers don't, they don't have the quality of education I had when I was in 10th grade. They can't teach it. They can, they can do checkoffs and they can do rote memory and they can do the level of, there's no creative thinking. The kids are barely reading at a level where they could appreciate Shakespeare or, or any of the Western classics or even Maya Angelou or Richard Wright. It is a crisis that all of us have got to engage because as Chief Bratton said, if we don't fix this, when he's looking at the hot spots of LA where the paramedics will not go in, where my client almost bled out in Jordan Downs after she was beaten by African-American residents who didn't want Latinos in that housing project, and my African-American clients who were firebombed out of the Ramona Gardens housing project because they don't allow African-Americans in that project. The paramedics wouldn't go in in either case because the, FB, because the LAPD was not available to escort them in. They will not go in without four officers with guns drawn. <coughs> I now have the angry white cops. That's how they introduced themselves. Ms. Rice, we're the angry white guys. I said, good, because I'm the angry high yellow woman. We'll make a good team. <laughs> you get them focused on solving a third rail problem. You not only get rid of the partisanship and the dysfunction, but you actually begin to craft solutions that change the mindset and the behavior and the, pro and the, and the product that you deliver. We've only begun to crack them out of LA Unified. But it wasn't the district that figured it out. It wasn't the politicians that figured it out. It was people like you and me. Thank you. <laughs>